Right Hello, on. comrades. Welcome back to the channel. I'm the Obnoxious Anarchist. Today we have a very special guest on the channel. We have uh, Dr. Abraham Weisfeld joining us, who is the chairman of the Revolutionary Bundist uh, Dias uh, the Revolutionary Jewish D Bundist Diaspora Movement, and is a second-generation Holocaust survivor by both parents who escaped the Holocaust from Warsaw and Lublin in Poland by finding refuge in the USSR. So, Doctor, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, it's good to see you. Uh, good day to you, and, uh, you know, it's good to be able to say hello to a whole new generation of revolutionaries. Hey, it's going to be great to talk to you. So uh, uh, the introduction that I gave was lean, but it was purposely lean, so I could leave you room to elaborate. So please, Dr. Weisfeld, uh, introduce yourself. Uh, introduce yourself. Well, we formed up the, uh, a, uh, a United uh, Jewish Bundes Diaspora Movement, you know, was centered in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, this was a result of, you know, like international flow of ideas. And uh, I've been trying to um, rebuild the uh, Jewish uh, Revolutionary Socialist Bund, you know, since, uh, since I founded the chapter of the Jewish People's Liberation Organization, or the Jewish PLO, so to speak in uh, 1989 with the publication of the uh, book, uh, The End of Zionism and the Liberation of the Jewish People, published by uh, Clarity Press in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, before that, you know, it was just uh, very, you know, small scale uh, local organizing in Toronto. Then I went to, to work with the uh, Palestine Embassy during the war of 1982 to 1985, when uh, the Zionist state invaded Lebanon and occupied Beirut and, uh, you know, brought its uh, allies, the Flanges, into the uh, Sabah Shatila camp and massacred 3,000 uh, Palestinian refugees in three days. And that was uh, the first book that I produced in uh, 1984. It was published, you know, and the book was called Sabah Shatila itself, the name of the uh, refugee camps, which I had visited in 1980 when I went to uh, speak with the PLO and I spoke with the Yasser Arafat at that time too. I guess I was oh. one of the first Jewish uh, people to speak with Yasser Arafat, wow. maybe the first person to speak with him. But, oh, that's uh, that's very, uh, very interesting, very interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's been a, but you know, like I never had the problem of trying to break away from the Zionist indoctrination that, you know, most uh, Jewish kids, you know, are sub subjected to because my mother was a Bundist, you know, uh, Jewish uh, socialist anti-Zionist, you know, from. Warsaw, and she escaped from the Warsaw Ghetto, you know, with her, by way of her brother, who was uh, an organizer in the uh, forest in uh, Russia across the border, and a partisan later on, and it was lost as a uh, partisan when he was, uh, after he was uh, conscripted into the Red Army. So there's quite a history there, and, and uh, I carried it, you know, with me because of my mother, you know, who educated me to be an anti-Zionist, you know, from the very beginning. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to ask you how you got into politics and all that, th all this kind of stuff. But I guess, uh, yeah, it was very deeply embedded in your family. I guess, I guess, I guess both your parents were politicized or was it just your mother? No, both. You know, my father was a socialist also. I mean, all the Jewish working class were socialists at that time in Eastern Europe, you know, even if they were Orthodox, like my father and my, my father's father, my grandfather, who I never knew. You know, he was a Hasid, you know, from a shtetl, you know, a little town outside of the city of Lublin, mm -hmm. in the south of Poland. And then uh, my father was modern Orthodox because he shaved off his beard because he wanted to get a job. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he was a socialist as well, you know. And then in the refugee camp where they met, you know, after they got out of the USSR, the Zionists came, you know, to try to convince them to go to Palestine. And there were even fights, you know, between socialists and the Zionists, you know, because uh, the Zionists were trying to put pressure on people to do so. So and this was uh, this was uh, in Toronto. You're talking about? Oh, this was in the refugee camp in the American okay, this was, all right. in Germany. Okay. Where my parents met first of all, where I was conceived in the refugee camp, in effect. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, so my my father explained to me that the reason why he didn't want to go to uh, Palestine was that he didn't want to go to another war. And uh, the Zionists, you know, were not religious. You know, they were just, you know, using the religion as a as a front, you know, for for their colonial project. You know, so. And we can we see that clear as day today. <laughs> yeah, and that was clear as you know, quite clear to me. You know, even before 1967, when Israel occupied the West Bank and and the Sinai and everything, and so uh, you know, I was organizing in Toronto. You know, the Jewish 
alliance, Jewish uh, non-Zionist alliance. Yes, that's what it was called. And we, in 1973, we had a, a counter demonstration to a Zionist rally, you know, during the, uh, the war of 1973, when Egypt uh, attacked uh, the uh, Israel's occupation of the Sinai Desert. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the Zionists had a big rally, you know, that was scheduled prior to the war beginning. And then we came along with a big banner, 20 of us, you know, like a, mostly a Trotskyists and anarchists. Mm -hmm. No communists. The communists were supporting Israel at the time. <laughs> oh, wow. It's interesting. <laughs> oh, yeah. The Communist Party was is reactionary, basically. And uh, this is the Communist Party here. Uh, you're talking about the one in Toronto, the one in Canada? Yeah, the Communist Party of Canada it used to exist. <laughs> It's yeah, through a couple of pieces, and neither of them uh, exist any longer. Wow. What a bankrupt uh, political uh, ideology it was. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> yeah. So then we had a demonstration there. We were up in the uh, the balcony around the Nathan Phillips Square of the Toronto City Council, you know, City Hall area. And so we went up onto the balcony around it, you know, in order to protect ourselves because we didn't want to, you know, be face to face, you know, with the Zionists. Mm -hmm. so we, unfolded a big banner saying, you know, not all Jews are Zionists. <laughs> <laughs> and so only 3,000 Zionists turned up that day, you know, because, I don't know, you know, they were so demoralized, you know, be yeah. attacked and, uh, and nearly uh, losing the war against Egypt, basically. And uh, then they started to get really upset, you know, really angry with us, you know, especially the Israeli ex-military who were living in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And the police actually came to protect us because they didn't okay. want to you know, have an international incident, you know, on their hands. I mean, yeah. how, how many, how many uh, non-Zionists were you on your side? Uh, we were 20. Oh, wow. <laughs> so uh, still 3,000 3, to 20, uh, it, it could have ended very badly. So, you know, it was, you know, really tough. But we got a lot of, you know, like uh, public support, you know, at that time. Mm -hmm. One old Zionist, he tried to sort of, you know, punch me in the face, you know, as I was handing out leaflets saying... Uh, um, peace now, mm -hmm. wow. you know, and, and I even sort of said it in Hebrew, you know, as people were coming into their, their demonstration, they thought that it was part of the demonstration. So they took the leaflet and this one old man, you know, when he read, read it, you know, realized that it was anti Zionist, you know, he got so angry, he came <laughs> and turned to me, you know, <laughs> with his fist and was going to punch me in the face, you know? So sure. I grabbed his hand and there was a photographer from the, a photographer from the Toronto daily stars, it was called at that time took a picture and was made the front page of the Toronto Star the next day. So, uh, oh, wow. Do you have a photo of that uh, cover page or? Uh, no, no I, uh, that's all right. Yeah. <laughs> it's, in the, uh, it's in the microfilm, you know, like at any li library, I suppose. I hear you, I hear you. So doctor, yeah. if you could just please tell us briefly about the history of the Jewish Bundist movement from, I guess it's inception until it's uh, contemporary iterations, if you will. Okay. So we were the first anti-Zionist organization, you know, before the Marxists. And uh, the Marxists, you know, were, were confused about Zionism. They didn't have, you know, like a, a, a solid position. And uh, they came to support, you know, uh, Zionism to some extent as well. You know, like Zionist parties were even allowed, you know, by the Bolsheviks to operate in the Soviet Union after the revolution. Whereas the Jewish Bund was not allowed to operate freely. The Jewish Bund was always, you know, like the big uh, rival, you know, of uh, both the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks. Mm -hmm. You should realize that by uh, 1903 even, just a few years after the founding of the uh, Jewish Bund, which was founded basically by, you know, adolescents, you know, mm -hmm. really. Uh, oh, yeah, you know, uh, you know, that's why I have immense respect for your generation, because that's, you know, where the innovation comes from. And uh, 1903... Uh, you know, the uh, Second International, which contained both the Mensheviks and the Iskaris, as the Bolsheviks were called at the time, uh, you know, both of them, you know, uh, only allowed for affiliation to the Second International by way of a uh, political party that was organized on the basis of a given nation state. Mm -hmm. So there was a German communist, you know, German, uh, German affiliate, you know, Polish affiliate, you know, all that sort of thing. And so there was no space in that political configuration for a Jewish political party, you know, even though, even, even if it was revolutionary socialist. Wow. And so that was the excuse that was used, you know, to exclude the Jewish Bund, you know, from the Second International in 1903. 
And that exclusion was supported, you know, by the Iskaris, you know, the Bolsheviks at the same time as the Mensheviks. Mm -hmm. So we were expelled, you know, from the Second International. Later on, there was a compromise in 1906, you know, to allow them back in. Nice. But by then, you know, like uh, there was a tremendous uh, high level of alienation between all the political formations. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the reason why they had to be let back in is because the number of members that each political formation had, you know, for example, the Bolsheviks at that time had 8,000 members. The Jewish Bund had 38,000 members. Wow. Wow. So that's a significant portion of the, uh, of the socialist population. Let's say that they were being left alienated at the time. That's incredible. Yes. Yeah. Totally ridiculous. You know, totally yeah. productive. And, uh, and, uh, you know, because the Jewish working class was generally, you know, like socialists, you know, whereas the uh, Christian working class, if one could refer to such a phenomena, <laughs> was generally uh, not socialist, you know, that they, they were, uh, you know, easily manipulated by the prevailing authorities. And well, uh, the prevailing authorities were probably Christian in most part, I, I believe. Yes, and the Christian nation state had a tremendous, you know, um, control by way of religion, you know, because the workers would be going to a meeting every week with their political leaders, who were their Christian political leaders, and they called it a church. <laughs> and they would get sermons, you know, which were basically political doctrine, you know, and, and, uh, and, and that's how, you know, the working class was controlled at the time. Now, uh, that has passed, you know. Here in Quebec, you know, for instance, uh, uh, the church, you know, no longer has hegemony, <laughs> to say the least, mm -hmm. like in the 50s. Even though the flag of the province of Quebec comes from the Catholic Church, it was called the flag of the Sacred Heart. Okay. Yeah. They just took the Sacred Heart out of the middle and they mm -hmm. kept the cross, and now this is supposed to be the flag of Quebec. Yeah, wow. Well, a nice secular state. <laughs> yeah. They even had, you know, a crucifix about the... Uh, the speaker of the uh, National Assembly for quite a while. It's yeah, that's it. removed, I, I understand. Yeah, they, they, they just recently took it down with the whole um, hoopla that they were having about this uh, charter of values and uh, removing religion from the state completely, when in, in reality, it's just targeting Muslim women primarily, let, let's be frank and honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is a copy of the French uh, uh, Christian nation state, you know, which has banned, you know, the porting, the wearing of the hijab, you know, the, the hair covering. Yeah. And now Belgium has banned the burqa, you know, which is the face covering and the, and the body covering, mm -hmm. which uh, are, are, you know, traditional, you know, dress, you know, which are worn by Muslim women voluntarily. You know, they're not compelled to do so by their husbands. Mm -hmm. Even if they're not married, they still wear a hijab, you know, because it's considered to be a sign of modesty. That's right. So, I mean, you know, if, uh, if uh, women, you know, want to sort of, you know, wear what they want to wear, you know, and even, you know, have slut walks in order to show <laughs> that they have a right, you know, to, to, to bear their bodies, you know, because they feel comfortable that way. Well, why not, you know, the other way as well, you know, it depends, you know, how women feel about themselves, you know, and that should be the criteria and none other. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, women's empower empowerment can take the form of modesty or it could take the form, of, uh, like you said, slut walks. And uh, uh, women's empowerment needs to be defined by women primarily. That's, that goes without saying less. Yeah. So uh, the Bund, you know, continued on. And uh, in the last elections, you know, held in Poland, you know, like in the city of Warsaw, the Bund won 17 out of 20, you know, municipal uh, Jewish seats. So, you know, very we, good. basically, you know, we had hegemony, you know, political hegemony over the Jewish working class. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, even above, you know, the religious parties. So, but the problem being that although we are the logical sort of logical political conclusion of what Jewish people should be aiming for in terms of, uh, you know, liberation as workers and both as, uh, as a national entity, you know, we have a double oppression. Uh, nonetheless, you know, all of the Jewish working class were killed off by the Nazis during the war. Yeah. Okay. So then the Zionists and the fascists, you know, both say, oh, well, good. You know, the, the Jewish socialists, you know, were gotten rid of. And this pleases the Zionists, you know, so they agree with the uh, anti-Semites, you know, they, <laughs> you know, they, they, you know, whenever the Zionists, you know, tell me that uh, the Bund, you know, is irrelevant and insignificant and was and no longer exists and all this. So I tell them, you know, well, 
why don't you go find yourself a local neo-Nazi and take, <laughs> invite him to, uh, you know, to have a beer with you, you know, in a local tavern, you know, and celebrate, you know, your victory over the book. <laughs> you know, like, you know, oh, it's such yeah, insanity yeah. on the part of the Zionists, you know, to say anything like that. I've even had one Zionist, you know, tell me that I should have been killed by the Nazis. That's disgusting. Uh, that's that's very that's horrible. Yeah, but yeah, the, I guess so. The Zionists were working with the fascists in order to suppress the 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 Jewish socialist working class. The Zionists weren't working directly with the Nazis. Okay, they collaborated with the Nazis in order to save their own membership. First mm -hmm. of all, mm -hmm. but in order to do so, they had to shut their mouths. And they weren't allowed, you know, to uh, boycott the uh, the German Nazi regime. Mm -hmm. So they actually, you know, had a commercial exchange, you know, with the Nazi regime in order to get, you know, their sixty thousand members out of the uh, out of Germany. And they uh, also made a deal, you know, with Eichmann in, in Hungary to get, you know, one thousand eight hundred and forty three or so, you know, uh, Jewish Zionists out of Hungary, while they were, uh, you know, they kept shut. And didn't warn the Jewish community about you know the uh, the Nazi death camps and how mm -hmm. the Jewish people should have you know escaped into the Soviet Union if if they had you know had confirmation you know from some of these you know Jewish leaders so-called Jewish leaders mm -hmm. so um, there is that degree of collaboration there was even you know uh, uh, Eichmann was even invited you know to go and visit you know like Palestine under the uh, tutelage of the Zionist movement, you know, to see the project there, because the Zionists wanted to convince the Nazis that they could coexist, you know, with the Nazi regime, wow. because at that time they assumed that the Nazis were going to win the war. Mm -hmm. So they wanted, you know, to get themselves in a, in a, in a good position in which they could survive. You know, this was geopolitics. Yeah. Very corrupt, you know, politically corrupt, you know, insane in effect, but this is what they did. So, you know, there's a lot to uh, blame, you know, and this is not just the right wing Zionists who are doing this. This is also, you know, the left wing Zionists, you know, so called yeah. socialists. Yeah, so, as, you, as you said there, the, that the communists were, were very like uh, yeah, pro Zionist, let's say. Yes, but even, you know, the left Zionists, you know, like uh, uh, Pro Sion, which means proletarian Zionists, you know, <laughs> that's their name in Hebrew. <laughs> and, they, <laughs> and they were the ones, you know, who had the militia called the Haganah. Mm -hmm. which, you know, carried out massacres, you know, in so many, you know, Palestinian villages to drive out the the uh, Palestinian population during the Nakba 1947, 48 and 49. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, it's so sad. And, uh, and the Bundes weren't around, you know, anymore, you know, to stop that. So my, my purpose uh, in, uh, in, in working, you know, was to uh, regenerate, you know, the, uh, the Jewish Bundes movement because one, it was necessary to counter the, the Zionist parties, and mm -hmm. two, you know, we had to, you know, organize the Jewish community again so that we could contend with anti-Semitism, you know, uh, as it existed and um, as it has regenerated. You know, at first in the 50s, 60s, you know, it was, it wasn't, you know, like uh, polite yeah. to be anti-Semitic, you know, like, and, uh, but, you know, the anti-Semitism still continued to exist, you know. Uh, you know, the first time I rebelled publicly was in the grade six, you know, when I had a a British uh, professor, Mr. Gardner, who casually turned to the class one day and said, and the Jews killed Christian babies during the Middle Ages, just like that, for no reason. It had no you know, connection with what he was talking about, which was something about science. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like I, I freaked out without permission. I didn't even put up my hand, you know, without permission, I stood up because you, you were not allowed to stand up you know, at that time without asking for permission by putting your hand up. Okay, and, and, I, and I pointed at him and I said, that's a lie in a rather loud voice. <laughs> <laughs> and this, you know, like freaked out the people and the professor so much that they were just frozen, paralyzed, <laughs> mentally yeah. paralyzed, neurotic trance. I've never seen this, you know, again, but, you know, I realized I had such a power, you know, with the words that I was able to, to formulate. And... Uh, Nobody said anything, and I realized, you know, that this was going to be dangerous for me, you know, because the professor, he could retaliate against me in some sort of a way. For sure. So I just, you know, sat down and kept quiet. Mm -hmm. But everybody knew, you know, and nobody ever talked about it again until at the end of the year, you know, we had a fight, you know, with the professor, and he, 
ended up chasing me down and hitting me with the, uh, a sponge ball that I had thrown at him. Oh, geez. <laughs> so you're a rebel from a young age, yeah? It's grade six, you know? <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. And it's crazy because, like, nowadays it seems like any uh, mention of anti-Zionism is instantly conflated with anti-Semitism, you know? Yes, well, because sometimes it is, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah, because absolutely. Because the anti-Semites, anti they use it, you know? They realize they had a, they had a good story to tell. Mm -hmm. So they use this, you know, whereas the uh, Jewish communists said nothing. And whereas, uh, you know, the, the Jewish Bundes, you know, the, the Western Jewish Bundes, you know, there's, there was the Jewish Bund, you know, in New York and Toronto and Montreal, you know, since, you know, like long time, mm -hmm. since the 30s. Oh, wow. But what did they do? Nothing. You know, the, I mean, the most you could say, you know, the, uh, uh, in terms of their political activities, was that they were, you know, like uh, into promoting Yiddishkeit, you know, Yiddish language studies, you know, they had schools and they had, you know, a meeting place in which they have, you know, various festivals and this sort of thing. But mm -hmm. they never said anything about, you know, Zionism. Until... So, so it wasn't inherently politicized, you would say, at that time? The Western Bundists, you know, were very conservative. You know, they were more like Menschewicks than they were, you know, like revolutionaries. I hear you. You know. And so I had to uh, regenerate the Jewish Bund, you know, uh, as a new Jewish Bund, as a Jewish socialist Bund, mm -hmm. not just as an ordinary, you know, Jewish uh, Yiddishkeit Bund. Uh, so it's been a big struggle, you know, like uh, on various planes. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. And in the in the West, uh, that's where, where 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 movements come to die, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I worked with the uh, Trotskyists from 1966 to 1976, mm -hmm. and the Trotskyists were anti-Zionist, but they weren't uh, pro-Bundist, you know? So, um, how does that work out? <laughs> well, they just, you know, like, gave me autonomy, you know, and let me do whatever I wanted to do, in, you know, in the area, mm -hmm. and it wasn't really included in their own sort of, you know, political program programming, and they never sort of, you know, uh, reported on this very much, and there weren't any articles in the in that in their in their press about it so you know uh, but they tolerated me whereas the communist party was pro-zionist at the time you know and they were yeah. they were recognizing the state of israel and all that and they were defending the state of israel against its criticisms uh, against its critics <clears throat> until 1967 and then the communist party had to uh, oppose israel because israel had occupied you know egypt and uh, part of Syria, mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> I can't remember if it was part of Lebanon as well at the time. <clears throat> so, you know, for geopolitical reasons, the USSR uh, decided to, uh, to oppose Zionism. <clears throat> so then I made contact with uh, one of the members of the Central Committee of the uh, Communist Party, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Uh, Danny Goldstock, uh, uh, who was in the uh, philosophy department at the University of Toronto, and we formed a committee there. Uh, he joined in the uh, committee and we were doing some good work until I was invited to go and visit the PLO in Beirut. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Communist Party considered the PLO to be a terrorist organization at the time. And so he, he split and left the organization and left me on my own and I had to continue by myself again. Uh, PLO was, uh, what is that exactly? That's... A Palestine Liberation okay. Organization. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's Arafat, you know, and, and all that. Yeah. And, uh, and then when I went to work with... Uh, the Palestine embassy, that was basically the PLO, run by the Fatah faction. Mm -hmm. And even Hamas, you know, uh, concedes that uh, the Fatah party, you know, controls uh, international diplomacy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was working with the PLO. I, I was, you know, PLO. That's why I founded the organization, uh, the chapter of the Jewish Bund, you know, called the Jewish PLO, or the Jewish People's Liberation Organization. Mm -hmm. And then our manifesto was printed in the book that was published by the Clarity Press in 1989. And that's what launched, you know, a lot of the Jewish opposition movement in North America. Mm -hmm. And uh, you were telling me that you had a brief teaching stint in uh, York University, but that it was cut short due to your pro-Palestinian activism. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? And, and why is it so hard for people who support Palestine to, you know, teach or just live? Uh, yeah, well, um, you know, I started my studies in, uh, in physics. And the uh, sciences, you know, I did my first degree in the uh, Bachelor of Science at the University of Waterloo. 
But in my third year, I decided to switch over to uh, studying uh, political science, you know, because I was always involved, you know, anti-Vietnam War work and uh, civil rights work. And, you know, it just became sort of, you know, so much more of a priority to do political work than to, to study sciences, even though I love, you know, the, you know, the, the mind expanding, you know, like phenomena of what, you know, science is in the 20th century. Absolutely. After the uh, 1905 Einsteinian revolution, you know, like <laughs> everything, you know, just opened up and a whole new methodology, you know, the old classical scientific method, you know, of cause effect, you know, was obsolete. The dialectics became, you know, like a totally elaborated and scientific format. Uh, it was wonderful, you know, mm -hmm. to say something like that. But, you know, the politics was so important, you know, like, because, you know, if there's no world left, you know, the, what's the point, you know, of studying, you know, sciences anymore. And besides, you know, like, Studying sciences, what can you do with that? You know, just contribute to the military industrial complex. <laughs> yeah. You know, like how are you supposed to do anything, you know, with it, you know, because they use, you know, every little bit of information, every, every little discovery that can be made by anybody, you know, like. So I ended up doing a study, you know, of war research at the University of Waterloo, which is a science university. As it turned out, I got some information from the US anti war movement that was published in the uh, congressional record that there was, you know, U.S. military subsidies for research in Canadian universities. Mm -hmm. Just like, what? What? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, like I tracked it all down, you know, found, uh, you know, all the professors and all the studies and all the names of their studies that were being done, published it, did an analysis, and it was printed by the uh, student union at the time, which was controlled by the anarchists mm -hmm. at the University of Waterloo. Okay. So then, you know, like I got closer with the anarchists, you know, because the Trotskyists, you know, uh, party wouldn't even publish my study and uh so even though you know the the uh the student union had allocated the resources you know to publish you know a special issue of our student you know anti-war uh, newspaper the uh, Trotskyist party you know wouldn't publish the study itself and they had you know one of their uh their uh you know uh good followers you know publish a report about the study oh wow <laughs> but not the study itself so, you know, I said, what's going on here? You know, like. What kind so, of a report? Was it like a scathing report that they wrote or was it no, pro? No, just a report, you know, pretending it, that it was their report and not mine. Uh, okay. So, uh, you know, and then I met Jim Campbell of the anarchists, you know, in, in Kingston, Waterloo. Mm -hmm. And I uh, continued to work with him, you know, on prisoner support, you know, work in Toronto in the prisoner solidarity uh, publication that was published in Toronto because it couldn't be published in the United States. Wow. Well. And we printed, you know, the letters of the American political prisoners at the time. So, and then, there's so much, you know, like. I hear you, I hear you. Feel free, feel free. <laughs> then there was a movement, you know, that some radical Christians started, you know, against the, uh, a military uh, factory in Toronto that was uh, uh, producing the guidance system for the American cruise missile, you know, which is a rather crucial component. You know, it's the whole reason the cruise missile works. And it was being made, you know, right there in Toronto. Wow. So we started to protest civil disobedience, you know, to close down the entranceway to the factory and everything like this. Like one year, you know, like we were being arrested continually, continually. Until there was a group out in British Columbia called Direct Action, anarchist group, of course, mm -hmm. which was blowing up, you know, like various, you know, uh, projects that were threatening the uh, environment at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, they actually drove across country with their van filled with dynamite brought it out in front of the Lytton factory in Toronto and blew away the front wall, you know. <laughs> said, you know, look, you know, you, know you, you don't let the protest continue. Well, this is what you're going to get, you know, return. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow, that's, uh, I love that anarchist, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't even know what the word I'm looking for. Uh, sabotage. Yeah, 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 that's it's definitely, when all else fails, I guess dynamite will do the trick. <laughs> yeah, it did. It did. You know, it worked. You know, and nobody was killed. You know, so what's yeah, the big yeah. deal? Uh, okay, so, so they, 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 after this uh, event, they had stopped construction of the. Yeah, yeah, they had to. Nice. But, but then the United States military brought the cruise missile into Canada to test it during the winter time, January the fifteenth. You know, in Alberta, at a testing range there. Mm -hmm. At a Canadian military testing range. Okay. So why would they do this? You know, why would they bring the cruise missile to test it out, you know, in freezing temperatures, minus 20 degrees, minus 30 degrees, you know, that yeah. sort of thing, you know, like out west. Mm -hmm. 
because they wanted to be able to use the cruise missile to attack the USSR over the North Pole. Wow. And when they were testing it, they would shoot it towards the north, of course. Okay, and, they, and you know, it wasn't known you know, how far they were going you know, with this and whether it was you know, loaded with a nuclear weapon or not. You know? And this was a secret you know, testing agreement that the, the very famous liberal, rad liberal, supposedly, you know, rad liberal, Prime Minister of Canada at the time called you know, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, hey. the Prime Minister, yeah. He made this you know, military agreement with the United States secret which is illegal, you know, according to Canadian law, because, you know, any military pact like that has to be approved of by the uh, House of Commons. Mm -hmm. So even the Conservative Party was upset with this because they were, you know, Canadian nationalists, you know, from the time of Diefenbaker who forbid the Bullmark missile to be placed in Canada because Canadians didn't want to have nuclear missiles, you know, in their territory because they were so turned off, you know, the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This was considered to be, you know, some sort of savagery. Now, even the conservatives had some sense at the time, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the conservatives, were, you know, broke the story in the House of Commons saying that, you know, Trudeau had made a secret military pact with the United States. And of course, you know, all the leftist supporters of Trudeau freaked out. And so it removed support from the Liberal Party to favor the Conservative Party. Because okay. people wouldn't vote for the Liberal Party anymore and the Conservatives would win. You know, that was their strategy. Yeah, it seems like that's really always how it goes, right? <laughs> right. So... When I found out about this, because I was doing research every day in all the newspapers, you know, at the Palestine office, and I come across, you know, this article. And I find, you know, wow. So what I did is uh, I, I went, you know, with, uh, with uh, some anarchist friends, you know, to the House of Commons gallery, you know, the public gallery there. You know, anybody can go into the gallery and watch, you know, the proceedings of the House of Commons. And so the conservative... Uh, you know, and, and so the Prime Minister had to agree, you know, to have the, uh, the whole, you know, military pact to test the cruise missile voted upon in the House of Commons because it was legally required. And so the Conservative, you know, guy got up and said, you know, this, you know, uh, was something that they opposed. And so just after he finished, I stood up in the gallery and shouted out, no cruise, no way. <laughs> You know, and, and then people, you know, all looked up, you know, because nobody had ever done this before, you know, nobody had ever spoken from the gallery, the public gallery, mm -hmm. before in the House of Commons. And it was recorded, you know, by, you know, the uh, uh, CBC radio and nice. broadcast, you know, right across the country, maybe even live broadcast. Okay. Nice. So, you know, uh, so of course they dragged me out. I just want to say we see a, con a continuity from your grade six self over here now. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> so then, you know, some uh, young people came and said they wanted to continue the protest. And, you know, and they, they brought T-shirts, you know, saying, you know, no cruise. And they, you know, hid it underneath their shirts. And then it came into the House Commons, sat there. And at one point, you know, all together, they all took off their shirts. You know, they stood up, you know, and they didn't say anything. They just showed, you know, the T-shirts, you know. That spelled out altogether, you know, no crews. Mm -hmm. So then they were taken out. So then, you know, with those four, you know, we said, well, we're going to start up, you know, I, I said, yeah, why don't we start a protest on the lawn in front of the House of Commons? And, uh, and they said, yes, okay. And I said, you know, but uh, we, I want to make it a, a continual, you know, like indefinite, you know, protest until they stop the cruise missile testing. They said, okay, but they weren't willing to stay there, you know, like full time. Yeah, that's a problem. So, really, you know, like it's sort of difficult. So, uh, so I said, okay, we made an agreement, you know, that they would apply for a permit from the RCMP, you know, for a four day protest, even though I knew from my political science studies that unlike the United States in Canada, all the lands, you know, that belong to the uh, state are called common lands mm -hmm. because the old, uh, you know, uh, crown lands in England during the English, English revolution were, um, were socialized, you know, so mm -hmm. and it became public parks, public parks or common lands. Mm -hmm. And uh, the levelers, you know, also were part of this, you know, whole process. They were like, you know, ancient, you know, British anarchists. And they called for the removal of fencing around, you know, lands that were supposed to be public, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, previously belonged to the Crown. So I knew that, you know, Parliament Hill in Ottawa was a public, you know, property. And, the, you know, if you had political reason to be there, you could have a protest. Yeah. That this would be constitutionally, you know, protected in a way, you know, under the uh, uh, liberty of expression provisions yeah. of, of the law. 
Mm -hmm. So I knew I could fight this, you know, I knew I could, you know, like a, a keep a peace camp going there. And some other people agreed with me and we kept it going. And then the first winter, you know, like I was ready to pack it up, you know, like, like oh, who's going to stay sure. out in the time, you know, like in a tent <laughs> on Parliament Hill, you know, like in Ottawa, you know, like minus 20, minus 30 degrees. Oh. But some other people did, you know, because we were getting an amazing press. And so, you know, they stayed, you know, and then they made it through. So just use a lot of blankets. That's all, you know. Yeah, that's it. So, layers and layers and layers. <laughs> So the next summer, you know, became very popular. People came from all over the country, you know, hitchhiking across country to join up. And then at the end of the summer, they were going to give up. And then I came along and I said, okay, I'll keep it going, you know, the next winter. So with a, with a, with a guy from Chicoutimi, uh, Yvon Dubé, mm -hmm. who was my French teacher, nice. my Quebecois teacher, we decided to keep it going. And we built like a, this cabin basically on Parliament Hill based upon, you know, like brick sleds uh, with a layer of, you know, uh, cardboard, with a layer of carpets, uh, with a layer of uh, sleeping bags, no, no, foam mattresses, and then sleeping bags, and then a, and then a lot of covers, okay. <laughs> and then inside the walls of the tent that we built, you know, they, uh, with the uh, poles of, you know, like uh, office poles that we found, and all the stuff we found, you know, in the trash, you know, around Ottawa, you know, in all the offices there. And we had, you know, one-inch styrofoam that we bought for $100. Okay. And, and we built that, you know, we even had, you know, like a, a nice kerosene heater inside there. And then we even had, and we used it, you know, to cook on. And we had a DC, you know, light bulb there. <laughs> luxury. Real luxury. <laughs> yeah. So we made it through the winter, you know, again. So it lasted, you know, like two years, mm -hmm. this protest. Wow. Wow. That's that's impressive, to be quite honest. I can't imagine contemporarily any kind of movement, uh, a sustained movement lasting for two years like that. Props. <laughs> right, right. And then, you know, like, that's when uh, Trudeau resigned. You know, he went out for a walk one night in a snowstorm on Parliament Hill. You saw the peace camp there still. And, you know, he resigned after that. You know, he gave up. Uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. Okay. He forced him to resign. Nice. Uh, out of shame yeah maybe we should uh, the the for those of us younger ones i'm not too young i'm 30 years old but maybe we should be learning from those experiences to maybe oust uh, this new trudeau <laughs> yes you know like uh, things like that can be done you know like direct actions you know but non-violent direct actions yeah. that can be accomplished you know very easily it just takes a question of will it's willpower that counts yeah, and I guess it, it is harder for people to stay out in the streets for sustained periods of time. Like, like I can't even imagine doing that. I work for, I'm forced basically to work 40 hours a week. It's really, really hard. But that is the key. It really is the key. These one-off protests, they're not going to do anything. We learned that the sustained protests are really what put the pressure on. Yeah, just like in the United States during the uh, Black Lives Matter revolt, you know, there were yep. some autonomous zones that were set up, you know, people took control of their of their area to control the streets and, uh, you know, uh, controlled, you know, like uh, <clears throat> who was coming into their area. So no fascists were allowed in, of course, which meant that they, they wouldn't have any violence, you know, imported into their communities, you know, by the fascists. And, For sure. And by the fascists, you know, infiltration of the police. Yeah. And, and I mean, there are problems with those autonomous zones, more notably that uh, A, they're bound to just fail. They were temporary uh, autonomous zones. They were meant to be temporary. And another problem with that was uh, they need to be defended. How, how could they be defended? You know what I mean? So, yeah, that, that's obviously another problem. But, yeah, they were great initiatives. Uh -huh. And uh, as we saw with the uprisings in the United States, that movements can completely be crushed by an election. Uh -huh. Like uh, the election of Biden. And now, now we don't see very much. You know what I mean? Yes. But it forced the police to be more cautious. You know, I've seen an estimate, you know, that because of the protests uh, during this period of time, 300 fewer African American, uh, black Americans were killed. Nice, we, nice. Yeah, these protests have saved the lives of 300 black Americans, you know, as a result, you know, because police are afraid to kill anybody now. It's a very good way of looking at it, like with that, with that, you know, uh, very often we get these, you know, cynical views about the, you know, as my view is a little bit cynical, but yeah, it is, it is nice to hear that silver lining. It is really nice. And let's, let's hope that, that that can last and it'll be uh, represented in the statistics as well, you know? Okay. But to get back to your previous question, sure. I ended up, you know, 
uh, being invited to teach at York University because uh, I uh, converged, you know, with the Waffle faction. Waffle was a Canadian left nationalist formation that developed inside the uh, New Democratic Party, which is the Social Democratic Party of Canada. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Waffle uh, were suppressed by the uh, leadership of the uh, NDP. And so they, uh, uh, but they existed in, in other areas, uh, like in academia. They had uh, a whole department, a social and political thought department set up at York University, which still exists today, alongside the political science department. They were also inside the political science department. And they invited me to teach, you know, of course. I said, well, sure, okay. Why not? <laughs> like, why not? You know, like, I, and this is when I was a graduate student. Uh, even though, I, you know, I my undergraduate degree was in sciences. But, you know, all those years, I was always reading political theory. So, you know, like, uh, I was more advanced, you know, than most graduate students, you know, because most graduate students weren't allowed, you know, basically to have read, you know, revolutionary socialist political theory. It wasn't mm -hmm. part of the curriculum. So I developed, you know, the, you know uh, a socialist, you know, uh, course in which I had the freedom, you know, to actually advocate, you know, uh, for socialism in the course and to prove it empirically, you know, with the uh, statistical studies that were done by uh, Clement, uh, for example, who showed that the uh, bigger corporations in Canada uh, were controlled by uh, American uh, multinationals, which set up subsidiaries in Canada to uh, jump over the uh, tariff barrier of 20%, you know, at the border. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, and we showed, you know, how Canada was an economic dependency of the United States, basically the backyard of the United States, and that, uh, uh, Canada was, you know, manipulated, you know, to, to provide a, a basin of, uh, of uh, super exploitation because, yeah. uh, you know, the American companies made more money here in Canada than they would have, you know, in the United States because they were paying lower wages here and they didn't pay the uh, tariff tax. And then they would cheat, you know, the Canadian government for taxation purposes by sending back money, by money transfers back to the parent corporation as an internal money flow operation. And then uh, the Canadian subsidy... Uh, would then declare they didn't have uh, as much profit as they would otherwise, so they would pay less tax, even while they were getting subsidies to set up, you know, in Canada by the Canadian government from public funds. <laughs> so it's, you know, like... <laughs> it's so predatory. This is predatory <laughs> behavior. So, you know, I explained all this in the course, you know, it was wonderful. But all, <laughs> all the lectures for that course, you know, were destroyed Fuck. when uh, I got arrested in Canada, in Ottawa, later on. I lost all those lectures, you know, a whole, a whole other book, you know, on, on Canadian political economy, I lost. I was arrested because, you know, after they destroyed the peace camp, uh, <clears throat> when the new conservative government came in, after promising not to destroy the peace camp, they they destroyed it, you know, arrested us at 7, 10 in the morning. Uh, this but, was, uh, sorry, this was the conservative government under the yeah, conservatives? Yeah, okay. after the liberals, you know, like uh, were defeated by the Tories. Mm -hmm. And then they came in, you know, uh, and uh, tore, tore the place apart. And uh, I kept, and they would, you know, detain us, you know, for three, four hours, you know. Then I would come back, we would come back and, and sleep on the grass, basically, you know, <laughs> from the protests, you know. And this was getting continual media coverage, you know, across Canada. Yeah. We have 80% support of the Canadian public, and according to a poll. Wow. <laughs> so, you know, like just a few of us, you know, were in an apprehended insurrection, basically. <laughs> hey, never underestimate the power of small groups to make big changes. Really, really, you know. So then eventually, you know, like when I went back during the election and the uh, Prime Minister Mulroney, you know, got worried. So then they had uh, me arrested and put into prison. So oh, wow. I was, yeah, I was put into prison at that time. Uh, this connects with what I was saying before. Uh, yeah, and while I was in prison, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, my roommate allowed in uh, a bunch of people I don't know who they were, you know, like uh, off-duty police or military who came from the military base, you know, just north of Ottawa, who used to attack the peace camp at uh, night on the weekends all the time. They came and they trashed the whole place. They took all my papers, threw them out, all my my violin, my camera, you know, everything, you know, like was trashed. Fucking scum. And the landlady threw it all out. And I lost, you know, the whole book of uh, lectures on political economy of Canada. This was your the apartment that you were living in? Yeah, in Ottawa, after the peace camp was destroyed. 
That's disgusting. I'm so sorry to hear that, but uh, that 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 is the nature of repression and uh, fascist oh, yeah. action. Yeah. yeah, serious, very serious. You know. Yeah. We used to get attacked by soldiers. You know, on you know on their off time, they would go and drink in Ottawa until three o'clock, until one o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. and then they would come and they would attack us. You know, for fun. You know, they would try to bust up. You know, the 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 walls so that we'd freeze inside. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, one time when uh, Yvon, Yvon Dubé, I should mention his name, you know, Chef de Quebec, he called himself. <laughs> Chef de Quebec. <laughs> yeah, well, it was sort of a bit of an ego trip there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway, you know, like, me, you know, like during the day, I was working in the Palestine office, you know, as a chargé d'affaires. I was a diplomat, mm -hmm. you know, working in the Palestine embassy during the day. He would keep it going. And I'd come back at night, you know, make supper on the, on the burner. And we talk in French, you know, and I learned French that way. Okay, so you do speak French. I wanted to ask you, 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 you do speak French? Mais oui, bien vie. Bien vie. Oui, je suis québécois maintenant. C'est pas problème. Alors, si tu parles la langue, tu es vraiment québécois. Mais oui, c'est ça. Tu vas comme ça. Il y a un petit ami qui était mon prof. Il y a un gars, you know, he was my French teacher, you know, from Chicago. Nice. I learned, you know, québécois, québécois. And uh, so uh, then when I was in prison, uh, then, uh, you know, they started testing the cruise missile again. So what could I do? You know, like I couldn't go back to Parliament Hill. I was in prison. Mm. So what do you do? You know, like nothing, just sit there, you know, and, and moan. No, I went on the hunger strike. Oh, called shit. Yeah, called up the media because, you know, we had one illegal right, you know, for prisoners to have access to a telephone. Mm -hmm. Called up the media. I had a list of all the media. Called them all up, and I said I was going to go on a hunger strike. You know, the following morning. You know, like an hour after I called up the media, you know, this guard comes and says, you know, like, uh, come here. You know, I was in a dormitory. Come over here. You know, he says, did you call the media and say that you were going to go on a hunger strike? And I said, yes. You know, tomorrow morning. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, okay, just wait a minute. Stay there. Don't move. You know, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You no, know, like he spoke like that. Yeah. Went to the lieutenant, comes back and says, come with me. So I go to the lieutenant and he holds like a trial, you know, because, you know, like inside a prison, they have their own laws, you yeah. know, laws within the law, mm -hmm. you know, and these internal laws, they don't correspond, you know, with the laws on the outside of the prison, you know, because you don't have any more democratic rights anymore. You don't have any more constitutional rights. You know, prisoners are not, you know, citizens anymore. They can, That's right. you know, and the United States, they're not even allowed to vote. So I go before the lieutenant and, you know, like, and he says, uh, are, are you on a hunger strike? And I said, you are, well, I will be in the morning and I'm not on a hunger strike right away. He said, ah, no, according to the regulations, you know, anybody who is disrupting, you know, the uh, prison from the inside like that is going to solitary. Oh, so shit. I went, okay. So I was sent to solitary right away. Whew. Okay. It gets worse. <laughs> okay. I'm listening. <laughs> you know, this is, you know, like, this is how, you know, like, a political prisoners are treated, you know, in a yeah, yeah, I hear you. democratic, you know, country. This yeah. is liberal democracy, you know. So in prison, you know, like, and so, you know, even in solitary confinement, I still had a right to use a telephone. Mm -hmm. So I turned the solitary cell into, like, an office. Nice. And, you know, like, I would call the media up every day, give them a report, you know, of what it was like, you know, to be on a hunger strike, you know, and, and, uh, and find out information about, you know, the uh, cruise missile testing. And so every time, you know, it was announced on the, on the media and on the radio, you know, uh, CBC, you know, radio in particular would announce every time that there was a cruise missile test, they would say, you know, like in a very somber voice, you know, cruise missile test, you know, took place today, you know, like from such and such time to such and such a time, you know, giving, you know, useless information. And then they would add at the end that the, uh, the you know, the uh, prisoner in protesting cruise missile testing is still on a hunger strike. Every time that there was a cruise missile test. So it just grew and grew and grew. And then, then they started to freak out, you know, they were trying to sort of, you know, make me give up, you know, the hunger strike and the guards even had a, you know, a bet game going on as to how long I would last. Okay. <laughs> now the trick to doing the hunger strike and that I read about, you know, like from the IRA prisoners on hunger strike, you know, Bobby mm -hmm. Sands in particular is that in order to survive a hunger strike, although you don't eat, you have to take water. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Okay. Otherwise, you don't last three days. Mm -hmm. So you have to take water. But in order for the water to be retained by your body, there has to be a little bit of salt in the water, 
Otherwise, you just piss it out. Okay. Okay? Because we are basically sea creatures. We come from the sea. Mm -hmm. That was our biology. So you have to take a little bit of salt in the water for it to be, you know, like retained. Mm -hmm. So you don't become dehydrated. So I kept, you know, the salt from all the meals that they gave me and, and turned back the meals. <laughs> so this one guard who was a fascist, you know, he, tr he tricked me into talking you know, because I was so spaced out, you know, like I would say nearly everything. Yeah. And uh, I told him, you know, about the salt, you know, because he told me about the bet game that this, that the guards, you know, were uh, undertaking. So I wanted to, you know, clue him, you know, that I was going to be able to last a long time, you know, that he should bet on me, you know, lasting a long time, you know. So, yeah. I, <laughs> so I, I would have, you know, somebody, you know, to, to, you know, perhaps, you know, help me out. Mm -hmm. No way. Nah. So he reported, you know, me to the, to the warden who came into the cell, held another, you know, uh, trial. trial. Yeah. Uh, another trial there, you know, with three guards, you know, to protect them, you know, and I was standing up against the wall and he said, you know, do you have salt here? And I said, yeah, I have some salt there. I need it, you know, for my water retention. So he said, oh, this is, a, this is an infraction. It's against the rules, you know, because if any prisoner hoards, you know, salt, that means that you can crush it up into a powder and then, you know, and hide it in your hand. And when a guard comes to, comes to bring you a meal, you can open up your hand, blow into the powder, which blows into the guard's eyes, incapacitates the eyes of the guard, and then you can grab their keys and then liberate yourself and run out of the prison. This is a far, this is such a far stretch, it's unbelievable. Okay, so they, <laughs> so they confiscated all of the salt. Fuck. And then any other meal they brought, there was no salt. And I turned back the meals, and, and so then I, then I started to become dehydrated. And then the lawyer, a lawyer came in, you know, and I told him about this. And I was after like five days, you know, like of no salt and no water retention, like I was turning you know, like purple because it was so cold. It was the winter time there. And, I, and the only thing they gave me, you know, to wear was, you know, a T-shirt. Wow. Not wow. even a second T-shirt, you know. And it was in, the, in a cell that was on the wind side of the northern side, you know, <clears throat> of the prison so that the wall was like freezing. If, uh, I showed the warden when I touched the wall and took my hand away. I showed him my hand was purple. Fuck. He didn't care. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> yeah. Try, and, and trying to look, uh, trying to look for sympathy or empathy in a place where there is none. So, you know, I just want to explain, you know, what it's like, you know, for a political prisoner, what can happen to you in a prison, you know, in this, you know, like country, let alone the United States of America. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and so then uh, 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 Professor, Professor Magnet, you know, who was a prof professor at, uh, at the University of Ottawa, constitutional professor, Jewish guy who was a non-Zionist. Mm -hmm. So he actually went and applied to a judge with habeas corpus, saying that I should be released, you know, because of the, uh, of the doubtfulness of my incarceration and the extreme conditions that I was being subjected to, mm -hmm. and the fact that I was uh, dying of dehydration. And uh, I got released eventually, yeah. Nice. Now, after how long were you released? Two weeks. Okay, so you were there for two weeks, and you were supposed to stay how long? Uh... Well, there was another uh, another month of uh, incarceration that I was supposed to go through, and so, uh, okay. and uh, so that that was outstanding. I I was supposed to go back to tr to trial for that. But, okay. Uh, and so, yeah, I guess you couldn't teach after that because of whatever criminal record. Uh... No. Um, I had you know, I had police record before that. You know, before I okay. talked to you know, like I was arrested at the age of eighteen. In, and when I was in uh, uh, demonstrating at the uh, Canadian National Exhibition, when the uh, PREL Trudeau came to speak, you know, to uh, to a crowd during an election campaign, and I went there to protest against youth unemployment and got arrested mm -hmm. there at that time as well, because I was handing out leaflets like right in front of him while he was talking. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, but I, ima I imagine that wasn't a criminal charge, was it? No. No, no they, didn't, they didn't even charge me after four hours to let me go, you know. Like, yeah, yeah, that's it, that's it. Yeah, you know, so. I but uh, the reason why I never got teaching again was because I had worked for the uh, Palestine Embassy and I put it in my CV and everything, you know, no problem. Uh, yeah, no so that, yeah, that's it. That's what it was for, really, this anti-Palestinian uh, sentiment that kept the universities from hiring you. And, uh, yeah, you see that even in uh, the universities today, where any any actions against BDS or something like this is considered anti-Semitism. There's a lot a lot of craziness, a lot of craziness. Yeah, yeah. I mean, try to sort of, you know, you know convince people that uh, uh, boycott divestment, 
this this investment and sanctions is mm-hmm. uh, supposed to be considered anti-Semitic because Israel is supposed to be a Jewish state, yeah. which it is not. It's a Zionist state. That's right. You know, there's seven and a half million Jewish people living in the United States, and only uh, six six and a half million living in, in inside the state of Israel. You know, so like. Um, who actually represents the Jewish people, you know, the Jewish Americans or the state of Israel, you know, like empirically it's, you know, Jewish Americans. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and the uh, Jewish Americans, you know, do not support the policies of the state of Israel. They're in the majority, a big majority opposed to the occupation of the West Bank uh, and previously of the of Gaza Strip. And they're, uh, uh, you know, in, in favor of a democratic society in which the Palestinians, you know, have equal rights. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, just shifting to Palestine here, um, I saw those photos of of you confronting the IDF and all this kind of stuff. So tell me, please, a little bit about your experiences in Palestine and and what you witnessed over there. I know Jason Unruhu also posted a short video about you where there uh, where there was a little bit of a scuffle. If you could go into that, I know it's been an hour now, but if you want to continue going, I'm down. Let's continue. Really, it's only been it's been an hour already. Wow, there's so much to tell. You know, like. Hey, I'm I'm okay. Uh, I I gotta leave work. Uh, that doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, what I did uh, and what we did in Palestine, you know, started in 1903. You know, after Rochelle Corey was was killed mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, very heroically <clears throat> in Gaza at Rafah, uh, trying to stop you know uh, a Zionist bulldozer, military bulldozer, from crushing you know, the the home of a Palestinian doctor who was uh, considered to be too close to the border. <clears throat> Because he was going to, you know, like build a, uh, dig out a tunnel in his basement that would you know? cross the border into Egypt, you know, supposedly. Okay. Fuck. So uh, a number of us in the world, you know, like, uh, you know, freaked out and uh, said, okay, we're going to go to Palestine and replace Rochelle Corey and uh, resist the occupation there. So I went to uh, Nablus because um, a Palestinian friend, you know, gave me contact, you know, with there that I could go and work with, you know, as a volunteer for. Palestinian Civil Society Association called Tanweer, Palestinian Cultural Enlightenment Forum mm-hmm. in Nablus, which still exists. So, uh, uh, oh, sorry. No, they, they came into existence in 2006. No, in 2003, I was on my own. Mm-hmm. So uh, I heard about protests in the uh, refugee camp of Balata, Balata, as it's called, uh, being organized by the ISM, International Solidarity Movement. So I, I got in contact with them and I was working with them. Uh, every day I would go there and we would uh, carry it out, out actions, you know, um, together with one member, Tom Her- Herndl from England, a uh, photographer, who later on went uh, to Rafa and Gaza and he was killed, and shot in the head, you know, thereafter. So 10 of us were working together. Four of us were actually Jewish, uh, one of whom was a, a black Jewish uh, woman from Sweden. So we were quite a diverse, you know, uh, crowd. And we'd go out, you know, and uh, uh, stand in front of the soldiers and stop them from coming into the camp, and that mm-hmm. sort of thing. But they would come in anyway, you know, in an armored personnel camera uh, carrier, you know, right down the, you know, the main street, the market street, you know, of the camp. And, you know, everybody would run away from them, you know, because they can open up a flap and stick out their gun and shoot anybody anytime, you know, you know, because they would impose a curfew, you know, on the Palestinian population, so stringent that they couldn't even go out, you know, to go shopping for food. Ugh. So we'd go out and try to stop that. And then uh, that didn't, you know, people would, you know, were encouraged, you know, by our presence there because we would protect them because they couldn't shoot anybody if there were these internationals there, mm-hmm. you know. Okay, so then they uh, brought in a bulldoze and they dumped, you know, like a, fi- a six feet high barrier of earth and stones, you know, at the entranceway and the exit, you know, to the market street so that, you know, no, no deliveries could be uh, brought into the camp, you know, for, with food. Wow. So we went out, you know, with shovels, and we were digging away at it, you know, to make a pathway over the, uh, over the, uh, over the mound. And then this chief pulls up, you know, with two soldiers who come in, and one soldier comes in and announces that what we were, what we were doing was illegal, <laughs> illegal according to what law, you know, Israel law. But that wasn't Israel; it was Nablus, you know. Like so, so, mm. so I turned to him and I said. You know, no, what you are doing is illegal. You know, in the Israeli protest in uh, dissident group, you know, Geshalom is uh, warning, you know, soldiers that they're going to be charged in the future if they carry out illegal activities under international law, mm-hmm. which is now, you know, under adjudication, you know, because the ICC, International Criminal Court, is investigating the Israeli soldiers now for what they're doing in the West Bank and, uh, and what nice. the uh, Air Force is doing on Gaza. They even bombed Gaza last night again. 
Oh, wow. So, so you know, he stole our shovels, you know, and uh, but he didn't shoot us. So, you know, at least, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we continued, you know, digging away, you know, and, and, and you know, and the women start to come, you know, the women were, you know, like more heroic than the men, you know, the women would come out, you know, and start, you know, uh, going uh, shopping, whereas the men were hiding away in, inside the homes. <laughs> Would there would, would there be uh, more of a propensity for the soldiers to uh, be abusive towards the men rather than the women, or was it precisely. kind of yeah precisely yeah. you know men would be shot you know that's it that's what not. I thought so so then the Palestinians got encouraged you know by uh, by our action you know which worked and uh, a Palestinian bulldozer operator came and removed the whole mound you know the next day you know it was cleared away. Mm -hmm. and, and so one more day, and they didn't come back to replace it, you know. The military gave up because we were there and because the Palestinians, you know, had, had taken this action. Nice. They realized, you know, if they put down another barrier, they would just be taken away again. Yeah. Okay. So this is resistance. This is how resistance worked. Plus, there was a huge barrier put up on the main highway in front of the previous governmental headquarters, you know, for the Palestinian Authority on Jerusalem Street in Nablus and uh, people couldn't even use, you know, like the main uh, road there, they were using side roads, you know, to get in and out of the city. Mm -hmm. So then the mayor of the city decided, oh, well, you know, let's take uh, advantage of this opportunity. And they sent bulldozers, you know, to take away the, you know, the big barrier on the main highway. And the highway was opened up after that. Okay. Then next up was that they, they went to, to the Makata, as it's called, the governmental headquarters and clear away the rubble because it had been destroyed, you know, by tank fire and by airplanes, uh, missiles. And that's where uh, Arafat, uh, uh, no, that, uh, no, uh, that's when Arafat was held under siege, you know, as well in two, 2001, you know, when General Sharon, who became prime minister, um, uh, you know, carried out this, you know, uh, in, uh, this uh, war against the Palestinian people. So the uh, rubble was cleared away and they built a new Makara and everything. Just because you know there was this initiative and, and and the resistance you know was shown to be successful and so they continued the, the resistance in this way, so that was 2003. And then I came back in 2015 because the military came and broke into a community uh, uh, organization called Tenweer, which I mentioned, mm -hmm. and they uh, uh, stole all the computers and everything. So you know I got pissed off, came back, set up a new computer. Uh, you know, like, because I had set up a, a, a computer room because at the time there was no, you know, like smartphones, you know. Mm -hmm. So for Palestinians, you know, to be able to get access to the internet, they had to have a computer and an internet connection. So I set that up, you know, we had eight computers there. Nice. And uh, the military came in at night, broke open the door and uh, stole all the hard drives from all the computers to see what information they can get. But, you know, of course, we didn't leave any information on the computers, you know, so... So <laughs> back in, in 2015, and I slept in the office of that place so that the military could not come back. Because mm -hmm. if they were going to come back, they would have to arrest me, a yeah. Jewish second generation Holocaust survivor, which is impossible if they were going to retain you know, the pretext that they were a Jewish state. Yeah, it's not very good for optics. No. So I caught them <laughs> in this contradiction. And so they didn't come back. They never came back. You know, and then I kept on coming back, you know, for for, you know, five months at a time, you know, the maximum time I could leave Canada and still retain, you know, medical card here. So uh, kept on going back, you know, to protect that community center and read Mayhem to organize doing demonstrations, planting expeditions uh, and educational programs of all sorts. So, you know, it's possible to even, you know, resist the, you know, military occupation force. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And you went there and you really, you, you, you really ameliorated some material conditions. You brought them internet, you brought them things that is, this is, this is very interesting. Very nice to hear. And uh, how long did you stay in Palestine in that second stint? Five months. Oh, wow. I'm wow. Coming, coming back in 2016, 2017, 2018 until uh, the pandemic when I couldn't go back. Okay. You would keep going on a yearly basis. I was living in Palestine. I became okay. a Nambusi, and I was an Nambusi, as we say in Arabic. You know, I began to learn Arabic as well. Nice, nice. Yeah, yeah. So, and, uh, it, yeah. Anyways, go on. So in Palestine, I'm called Doctor Abraham, and I'm considered to be a Palestinian, a Jewish Palestinian. Nice. Uh, 
There's also a whole tribe of uh, Jewish Palestinians who live on at the summit of the mountain, the Mount Gerizim, called Samaritans. Okay, yeah, yeah. And they have, you know, Palestinian documentation, Israeli citizenship, and Jordanian citizenship as well. Wow. And they consider themselves to be Palestinians. They speak Arabic. And the older men, they will, they wear traditional dress, you know. And, you know, they walk around, you know, like, and everybody knows that they're Jewish, you know, but they're just considered to be sort of like normal Palestinians, you know, just like anybody else. There's yeah, no problem. The Palestinians don't hate Jewish people. Absolutely. They just hate soldiers carrying guns who Absolutely. call themselves Jewish, you know. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's like a similar situation here where I don't think like uh, indigenous people necessarily have hatred, but, you know, we are settlers. We are settlers. And there's a lot of baggage that comes with that. Absolutely. Yeah. Tremendous alienation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's why we have to uh, each uh, mutually offer us a mutual uh, recognition for each mm -hmm. of our liberation struggles, recognize that each of us have organizational autonomy for national cultural autonomy, national cultural territorial autonomy even, for the First Nations and for the Black Nation. And we have to form a united front in order to combat the, uh, the fascist for forces which have uh, infiltrated and taken over you know, many police departments, the FBI, and uh, many uh, military uh, units as well. So mm -hmm. I think this is uh, you know, uh, a point at which we could um, sort of, you know, uh, end for the moment mm -hmm. but i would like to come back and talk with you about you know the montreal politics you know absolutely the student general strike of 2012 when we won we mm -hmm. stopped tuition fee increase and we brought down the government at that time so let's look forward to that interview later on okay yeah absolutely and it's a it's a very special place in my heart so i look forward to talking to you about that and uh thank you so much for coming on honestly i've learned so much it was a pleasure talking to you and i do look forward to the next time uh dr weisfeld Thank you. Isn't this so great? Oh, this is wonderful to get there. I was like this. I okay. love it. Eh? Solidarity forever. <laughs> okay. Solidarity forever and never again. <laughs> Solidarity, comrades.